Hello, welcome to this talk about OpenTCM's journey to connecting OpenShift clusters securely and transparently with Submariner. I'm Stephen Kitt, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, and with me is Mark Tang. Yeah, hi, um, I'm uh, Matthijs Schramman, I'm uh, working as a cloud engineer for the Dutch government. Yeah, and so we'll start with an overview of what Submariner is, so that you can understand exactly what we're talking about. Submariner is a project that is designed to connect multiple cl uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, at the networking level. Um, it does so by exposing new custom resources that are stored in the standard Kubernetes data stores. And I'll go into that in more detail in a little while. It's an open source vendor neutral project that was started by Rancher and is now maintained by Red Hat with help from contributors from a number of different companies. Uh, and one of our Big goals is to make it easy to set up and use. And uh, part of this is we make it available for deployment using an operator or Helm charts or our own tool, which is called Subcastle. So some common use cases for Submariner are application availability. So this is, this is where you have an application that's available inside one cluster, and you would like to use it in another Kubernetes cluster, but you can't easily deploy it uh, in that other cluster. And you don't necessarily want to make it available using uh, publicly accessible endpoints. Submariner can help you with that. Another use case is disaster recovery, where you want to basically ensure that your data is replicated in a number of different geographical areas, for example, uh, so that you can recover uh, if you lose one of your clusters. And another big use case is data residency guidelines. So you might have. Um, workloads that are available in a specific, or that can be processed in a specific area, or you want to be able to use, for example, cheaper CPU time in one uh, availability zone, but your data has to remain resident in a specific geographical area for legal reasons. So Submariner can help you with that too. So what Submariner does um, is help you with the networking layer. And so to understand that, we need to go over briefly what Kubernetes does. Uh, Kubernetes has a very cluster-centric view of the world by default. The cluster boundary is a hard boundary. Um, and so you can see here a fairly typical view of the network stack in Kubernetes. You have a number of pods inside your cluster. Each pod uh, is connected using pod IP networking. So each pod has an IP address and can communicate with other pods in the same cluster uh, on a private network. Each pod also benefits from service discovery and load balancing. Workloads can be made available as services, and pods can address those by name uh, and have load balancing among multiple instances of the same service. And finally, you also have network policy, which allows you to define rules which say which pods have access to which uh, parts of the network. And Submariner extends this across multiple clusters. So it doesn't touch the pods model itself. Pods are still private to each separate cluster. But it extends the networking data plane across all clusters so that every single pod can have access to any other pod in any other connected cluster transparently. It also extends service discovery and load balancing. So services can be made available from one cluster to another and load balanced uh, within each cluster. So uh, typically, for example, a, a cluster would um, connect to any remote cluster which makes a service available, unless the service is also available in the local cluster, in which case it would prefer the local cluster. And it also extends network policy, uh, because the networking layer preserves source IP addresses. You can have rules which take into account the provenance of traffic. And it does all this, as you can see, with the padlock in a secure fashion using uh, IPsec tunnels by default. And it also supports WireGuard. So all the traffic is encrypted between the clusters. What are the benefits then? So as we've seen, uh, direct e to s pod to pod and pod to service routing across clusters. It works with any Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and it's, it can work with a number of different CMIs that we test with uh, OVN, for example, which is the default now in OpenShift. Uh, also, Weave. Um, 
There's some work that's been done with Calico and a number of other uh, CNIs, and we'll give links later to the documentation you can look at that describes all these. Services can be deployed across clusters. So this is at the basic level, just port to service IP connectivity, but also, as I mentioned, service discovery and network policy. And it provides all this in an encrypted uh, fashion, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. Here's the, a diagram of the high-level architecture of Submariner. Um, so the top section is what we call the broker, which is uh, one of the clusters. It can be a dedicated cluster or just one of the joint clusters, which is used to store and share all the data that's required across all the clusters. And each cluster that you want to integrate as part of uh, a sort of larger set of clusters using Submariner is connected to this broker. Uh, and uses that to obtain information about all the other clusters. Uh, and inside each cluster, each node gets a root agent. This is what uh, takes care of traffic that has to go to another cluster and make sure it gets to the right place. And at least one node in each cluster is, des is designated as a gateway. Uh, and so that hosts the gateway engine, which takes care of the tunnel to all the other clusters. Uh, and so traffic gets routed from each node to the gateway and then across to the target cluster and back again. Next slide, please. Network connectivity with Submariner. Um, so there's no impact on intra-cluster traffic. This is very important. All the traffic that stays within the cluster uh, uses the standards network setup, whatever that is inside your cluster. So, so there's no impact from using Submariner on the local network performance. Um, and it's only traffic that has to go to a remote cluster goes through one of the gateway nodes. And as I mentioned, source IP is preserved, which means that, well, traffic can go back the other way, of course. And you can also specify network policies that take the source IP into account. And by default, we encrypt cross-cluster traffic. And another big feature in Submariner is that we can handle clusters that have overlap, overlapping ciders. So if you set up most clusters without necessarily envisioning that you were going to want to connect them at some point, and so they have conflicting IP addresses, Submariner can add its own addressing overlay uh, to provide unique addresses across all the clusters. And this is called Global Net. Next slide, please. Service discovery, so this is the layer on top of pod to service IP, which provides service discovery across clusters. And this is actually an implementation of a, a spec that's not defined inside Submariner itself, but it's part of a, a larger effort uh, in the Kubernetes multi-cluster service special interest group. And this is called the multi-cluster service API. So that defines a standard or shared rather set of terminology and some shared features. So the first uh, term is cluster sets, and this is a, a group of clusters uh, that are all connected to each other and that share services. Uh, and uh, this introduces an important concept in the multi-cluster service base, which is that all namespaces with the same name are considered to be the same across the clusters. This is called namespace sameness. Uh, and then the multi-cluster service API defines two CRDs that are used to share services. The first one is the service export CRD. So this is an administrator-controlled CRD, which is used to specify services that should be exposed across all clusters. Services aren't exposed by default. Um, to export one, you create a service export CRD. Uh, and this makes the service available across all the cluster sets in a new uh, subdomain. Um, under .svc.clusterset.local, so it follows a similar pattern to services inside a single Kubernetes cluster but across the cluster sets. And then the other CRD is a service import, and so this is the in-cluster representation of a multi-cluster service, but this is really just an implementation detail in practice. Next slide, please. So 
So how all this is done in uh, Submariner, Service Discovery uses a component that we call Lighthouse. So this builds upon the existing Submariner architecture with the broker uh, and so on, and it adds a number of components. Um, and so the general idea is that when uh, a pod or a service requests a uh, cluster set wide service, so it uses the .svc .cluster set .local uh, name, that gets resolved not by core DNS or well the main DNS provider inside the cluster because it isn't aware of all of this. Instead, the, the DNS resolver is configured to forward these requests to Lighthouse's own DNS server. And so DNS, that DNS server, server is aware of service imports. And so it knows about services that are available in other clusters and that have been exported. Uh, and it will use the information from the remote clusters and from the broker to resolve those services to an IP address that Submariner can then take care of. And so traffic can get to the other cluster. So that was a brief overview of what Submariner does and some of how it goes about it. Uh, but the purpose of this talk was to uh, go over our journey with uh, ODT Nord. And so Martin will present what ODT Nord is uh, in just a couple of minutes. But uh, I wanted, before I conclude my section of this talk, to give, a, give some of my uh, impressions from working with Martin and his team. So the purpose of the uh, POC with proof of concept with OGC Nord and Submariner was to uh, get, from our perspective, early feedback on features and usability. So when we are in this sort of engineering groups, we don't necessarily have much direct feedback from end users. Uh, and so this was an opportunity to get that. Uh, and it led to of a big initial drive at first on ease, of, ease and speed of installation and the importance of being able to upgrade. Because uh, when we were working with uh, Martin and his team, uh, they were very willing to test new things and uh, iterate frequently. But that meant that we had to make it easy for them to do so. Um, and frictionless, because obviously we didn't want to lead them into a situation where they'd upgraded to a, a bad release and they ended up stuck there, uh, or we'd end up spending lots of time helping them to fix things. Uh, and one of the big um, gains from our perspective is that we were able to get a good idea of customer, well, features that were actually useful for customers. and so. Uh, OTC Nord provided us with a number of feature requests um, that we hadn't necessarily thought about uh, and that were provably useful for end users. And so the first one of these, which is uh, insecure connections, that was actually somewhat surprising for us. I mentioned that uh, cross-cluster traffic is secure by default, and this was a big feature uh, in Submariner from our perspective. But it turns out that it's not desirable in all cases. Um, and so in some cases, end users can have private connections between Kubernetes clusters. And so there's no point in adding extra layers of security on top of them. It just reduces the network performance. And so this was a big uh, request from WC Nord. It's taken a while to implement, but it's actually uh, landing in the next release of Submariner. Another one that went with this is high bandwidth. So uh, ODC Nord has a high performance network, uh, physical network, and the desire was to be able to use as much as possible of this uh, in Submariner. So, this led also our investigations around the high bandwidth and uh, bandwidth issues led us to implement a benchmarking tool uh, because we knew how to run benchmarks and the ODC Nord engineers knew how to do that as well, but re repeating that all the time was somewhat painful. And so we integrated all that into a benchmarking tool at their request. And then in addition to that, so network policies, they were a, an important feature for OTC Nord's own customers. Uh, and another big um, takeaway that I had from the working on the proof of concept was that knowledge is power. Um, we 
benefited greatly from having different people on the team with extensive expertise in all the layers of the stack that end up being used at OGC Nord, in particular at the OpenStack networking layer. Uh, and so if we had just OpenShift or generic network experts in the team, we might have tr had trouble helping OGC Nord with some of, some of the problems that they ran into because they have a fairly complicated uh, OpenStack setup. But that's enough from me, and I'll, I'll hand over to my time now. Uh, I'll give you lots more information about OGC Nord. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Steve. Um, let me introduce myself first. Um, I'm uh, Matthijs Traban. I'm a, a cloud engineer for uh, the Dutch government. Um, and uh, OGC North, it's uh, North stands for North. We are located mainly in the north of the Netherlands. Um, it's one of the four Dutch government data center agencies. And so in the past, we had many uh, data centers uh, in the, inside the Dutch government, but decided, I think, eight years ago to consolidate it to four data center agencies. And at the moment, we have uh, two data centers running in the north, the two red dots you see in the picture. The land, land, uh, land car of uh, the Netherlands, and the third one is available this year. Um, so a little bit uh, uh, perspective and history from our um, as, as Red Hat customers. We are former CoreOS users. So in 2017, we started our container journey with uh, Kubernetes because um, we saw inside the Dutch government, uh, many government agencies are moving towards microservices and uh, wanted to use uh, uh, container platforms like uh, Kubernetes. So we thought, hey, that's an opportunity to, to create a get, just to create some kind of managed service for uh, our government agencies. And um, we are, until now, we are pretty successful in it. So um, um, since uh, Red Hat took over uh, CoreOS, we moved to OpenShift. So, um, I think since January 2019, we're in production with OpenShift 3.11. There are still some 3.11 clusters left, um, but the rest is all OpenShift 4.6 now. And uh, well, yeah, our main, so I think we have about three, more than 3,000 cores uh, running on multiple clusters. Um, but we have main, um, we, we are ready for, we want to move to the next step. And the next step is make these clusters more resilient for failures. So our customers can uh, make their uh, workloads more robust for our Dutch, uh, Dutch people. So um, we were wondering and looking how, how can we make these OpenShift clusters more reliable, more high available. We just did a lot of reading and proof of concepts. And um, well, we reached out to Red Hat Netherlands and just please help us. How can we do this? They came up uh, with the Submariner project. We did see it um, when it was at uh, in the hands of Rancher, and um, we left it first. But uh, then Red Hat took over, and um, ah, we we got an opportunity, like uh, Stephen uh, explained, to work closely together. So um, yeah, so we're almost ready for the next step. So um, and what that exactly is? Um, um, what 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 do we expect? To, if we just say, let's say, install OpenShift clusters on all these free data centers, that's what we want to achieve this year. Um, we want to be able to connect clusters so we can sync data, or we or our customers can sync data. We want to have pod to pod connectivity. Um, as I will explain in my next sheet, we, we are already able to, we have a high, highly high available uh, network with high bandwidth between these data centers. It was already present, so we were able to communicate uh, between these clusters in these several uh, the different data centers. But we were not able to do pod-to-pod -pod connectivity, so we got a fairly static setup, which was not really helpful. So that's why we want to have pod-to-pod -pod connectivity. We want it to be secure. We want to leverage the available bandwidth, uh, not too complex to configure. Um, it had to be cloud slash network agnostic. So like Stephen mentioned, we are running on OpenStack, but maybe we are using in the future something else. So it also has to work on that. So it must be open source because uh, we believe in open source. Everything is open source, what we do in, uh, 
in our in our company. Um, and um, the last two bullets: um, load balance traffic across multiple clusters and do dynamic health checks. So, well, we thought maybe that's a little bit too much to to do in one year of let's say one and a half years. Let's focus first on the east-west uh, scenario. And uh, now that's what we can do exactly with Samara. So um, we uh, have been working with them closely uh, together since uh, June um, 2020. So I think it was version uh, uh, of four. And yeah, like Stephen explained, we've been testing new features, new releases. We could test upgrades. We did have regular feedback sessions, which were very helpful. Uh, we learn a lot about our performance, so uh, just how much performance can we get out of, the, out of the network and out of the clusters. So that also led to several OpenStack optimizations, which were really, really helpful. We didn't figure out ourselves yet. So our, our, just, our entire cloud just benefited from these other OpenStack optimizations, also non-OpenShift container workloads. So this was a really cool, cool, cool benefit. And uh, yeah, we just we made our cloud available to the submariner team. team. They could just use it to uh, to investigate issues or to make things better. And even so important, it was very cool. It's a very cool and professional team to work with. So if you ever get this opportunity, grab it. But it's really it can be really really helpful for your own use case. Okay, something about our infrastructure. So. Um, Yes, we are Reddit customers, so uh, we're using OpenStack. OpenStack at the moment we are at train, we're running more than six thousand VMs, um, installing OpenShift uh, on top of OpenStack. So we all, all also using the nice OpenStack uh, APIs for standard block storage. We also have an encrypted variant, we're using Octavia for uh, service type load balancing, Manila for read write many storage, and a roadmap issue, a roadmap thing. Um, we're probably going to look at the ironic bare metal integrations for next year. Ceph has a storage layer, more than two, uh, approximately 20 petabytes. And we have S3 compatible object storage. Implement on multiple regions, the red dots. And uh, these data centers in the north at the moment are connected with dark fiber, which they dedicated um, uh, fiber channels. She has a lot of bandwidth, so um, and it, this this network has been in, imp, implemented as a layer three network. So this was a really good fit for Sumerna. So some high level network architecture. Um, um, at the moment, so we have two DCs uh, running active active, and the third one is in the making, and uh, probably operational by the end of this year. And what what we want to do is to connect, let's say, three clusters together so we can make a very uh, a reliable uh, infrastructure. Yeah, so I think one and a half years ago, we had a power outage on DC1 and everything was gone. That's not good for, uh, for our business. So um, um, we want to make things more robust. So um, these DC links I've been uh, uh, drawing here, one has for the, the ceiling between cluster A and B is the connection Stephen mentioned. We control it ourselves. We already have encrypted that with our network, uh, net, network uh, devices. So we didn't have the use case there to be to, to have an extra encryption layer on top of it. So that's the requirement we wanted to be able to turn it off. But for the other connection to A to C and maybe to, from B to C, um, we do not control the network path, so we can enable the extra IPsec. And maybe just the um, in the future, we are going to connect. We can move as a government uh, public workloads to, uh, to the public cloud. There is maybe also a use case for us. So I want to conclude my talk with a uh, small demo. It's a uh, ProgDB uh, of uh, two OpenShift clusters on DC1 and DC2. I will show you uh, in a minute. And I've installed a ProgDB on um, both clusters and the Nodes former cluster, and I will try to create some kind of database 
well, it's going to be created on the other end. So I will show you first we have a uh, multiple clusters running. So you see here our uh, first cluster. You see it here, GN2, that's DC1. We have our second cluster. You see it here, it's GN3, DC2. And inside these clusters, we have installed um, and Submariner, so I will show you the, uh, the gateway, which is installed on a, on a, a uh, this is a pod running on a certain node. We do not have dedicated nodes for it yet, but we are planning to. So if I just use the um, open shift, uh, uh, looking for a gateway. So you see how many instances do we have on a gateway. You have to look up the right namespace. We do have, you see, two gateway instances running, and one of these is the leader, so I think it's the, this one. So I just want to show you, you can, which you, it's a nice feature, you can look up in this gateway what the connection is between the, the other, between the, gate, the gateways on both clusters. So, oh, sorry. You see here we connected, this is DC2. You see here we are connected to DC3, uh, and you have all have kinds of features where you can see uh, the latency, the average, last, max, minimum, where the status is, it's connected. Active, this is the active one, so this is, this is not the, 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 the passive one. All kinds of need, this, the backend delivers one, so all kinds of information which is useful to check if the gateway is alive. Uh, what's also is, is nice is the, um, I will switch tabs now, is the um, able to uh, to look at some metrics. So, um, so Mariner's exposing Prometheus metrics. So if you want to just look, the, you can plot these latency, this connection latency seconds in a nice graph. You could use the, uh, uh, of course, the Prometheus workload monitoring, which is in the side of OpenShift for monitoring and alerting on it. So it's a really nice feature they've added. Um, so yeah, uh, really cool. Um, so now back to uh, the demo of just some proof. This is really working. So I've been, I've been installing two um, the name cockroach DB, DB uh, uh, instances. So this one is running on DC2. Switch the um, yeah, this one is DC. Yeah, I will look it up. This one is on uh, DC3. So you see the pods are running. Ignore the container creating thing. Um, so if I hop over to the uh, cockroach DB uh, uh, UI, you see it's connected. It has nine nodes, three pods on each side. So you can see these nodes are connected on GN2, DC1, and GN3. You also see this on the other side. This should be GN3, GN2, GN3. So this proves these, this all cockroach DB uh, cluster is able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to communicate with each other. You have all kinds of nice latency maps. Also useful to see how fast is the communication between these, between these nodes. Uh, we haven't been looking and tweaking it in detail, but we do that later. Um, so yeah, this is a really cool uh, thing to show. Uh, I think it's working. Um, just to prove the part of the, on the pudding is to create a database. See what kind of databases are in this instance. We have a demo database. Well, I should have been deleting it. I will delete it now and re recreate it. Um, so I, I will go inside a. Uh, Cockroach DB pod. Keyboard sleeping. There it is. So I'm connecting to the cockroach. Instance. Oh, oh sorry. So I've been connected now to the uh, 
to the database instance. Now let's say I will create a database, create database. Uh, demo. Boring demo two. No, it's telling me it's been created. So if I go back to the uh, Cobras DB UI, I refresh, refresh the instance. I see I have a new database created. And now it needs to be also on the other end. I see. Yeah. You can see it's also been created on GN3. So this proves it's a really simple demo, but yeah, it, it proves that it's uh, it's syncing the data between the uh, the, the both Cobras DB instances for Sumeru. So, um, well, yeah, this concludes my demo, and I will go back to the presentation. Um, so, if you like to read, look up on Sumeru, just visit these links. Uh, thank you for your time.